Right there, welcome back to Stratford Paddock. Stephen Alston today, joined by Matt Dickinson from The Times. Thank you for joining me, Matt. Pleasure. We are here in the media centre at the World Cup in Qatar, and I think it would be wrong of us to not talk at least a little bit about the World Cup um, before we get into what you're here for, which is Summer 98 to Summer 99, and let's ignore everything else in the world. So let's get the boring bit out of the way. World Cup, have you found it? Well, I've been lucky to go to some uh, great games. Um, I was at Saudi Arabia beating Argentina. What a game that was. was yeah, and it wasn't it was a smash and grabby, but it was just a good performance, oh, wasn't it? Absolutely sensational performance. And um, obviously watching England, you know, gather some steam, you know, suddenly hopes are, as we stand uh, sitting here now, hopes are high that it could this be the one. Um, so, and also, but as a reporter, also, obviously, it's been fascinating all the other issues that we've had to deal with. You know, they've been going on for more than a decade. But yeah, now we're here. You know, we've had to cover you know, the, the social issues, too. So, yeah, it's, it's not been uh, it's not been dull. That's for sure. Your experience of Qatar so far, have you found it? Yeah, it's a hard but I would say it's a hard place to get to know. I mean, you know, I, I, I think, you know, it's the most amazing thing is you don't meet Qataris. I don't, you you, yeah. might, have done, you no, might have done better at that than not. me. But maybe you know, one, I think most of the guys who, you know, where we're going out to restaurants or in ubers most of the guys you meet are indian bangladeshis pakistanis and that's just one of the the many shall we say quirks of this country yeah I, i've enjoyed my time here but like you said the 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 qataris i have no idea yeah. I, I i think i might have met one we went to a, a falcon suit the other day where they sell falcons Do you know falcons go for a million qatari real are you taking one home or no lamborghini <laughs> money on a bird you imagine <laughs> Um, but I think one of the guys that we met there was Qatari, uh, right. the guy talking to us about about the birds. But yeah, outside of that, every single person that we meet um, has moved here. So it's a, it's an interesting sort of gaff, I guess. I met yeah, I mean, I met a guy, an English guy who's been a teacher out here for twenty five years. Um, you know, he says he's having a nice time. It's a perfectly pleasant time. Equally, you know, I said sort of, you know, go on, give us a, a special tip of where to go. And he mentioned a, an Irish bar on the 14th floor of one of the hotels. So it's it's a place that is still got a lot of developing to do. I mean, I went for a walk. There's this, ma yeah, they're building a city effectively near the Luceo Stadium. And That's where my apartment know, is, actually. Okay. And yeah, and you just wonder, you know, fascinating question of what is that place going to be like in 10 years? Who's going to move there? Do they want to become a Singapore are they going to? Be, is it going to be full of expats like you know, Dubai and other Emirates in in five ten years time? You know, I think they're almost sort of waiting to find out themselves. Yeah, do you know what Lucille reminds me of? Media City without a stadium. Yeah, no. everything's brand new and yeah. no one's there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's a good it's a good point, and that's that is the thing. I mean, it's I think it is a country that is sort of almost you know I'm sure they'll say they've got a plan, but. Um, you know, speaking to people who work a lot out here, they say they're still waiting to find out what that plan is. Basically. Yeah, and I think some of the, the main roads and the highways and some of the hotels are outrageous. Um, but my street is a building site. It's like three buildings, four buildings built, and three or four that aren't built, and they're in the process of being built. Well, they're like, if you know, if they do want a lot of expats out here, they'll either have to uh, raise raise the salaries or drop the beer prices, I guess, because um, I'm sure you've experienced a bit of that. I've tried to get into the uh, red line, all in the interest of research, uh, last week, and there was an hour-long queue for because partly because obviously it's uh, seven quid yeah, a beer. There's a, there's a teacher that I know myself out here and she was telling me the red line was the first one out of a man was to go to the red line for it. Um, yeah, I think I've been paying. For those, I know a lot of Brits love to talk about how they experience the place through the price of a pint or a bottle. Uh, it's ranging between about 13 to 17 quid, I would say, for a bottle of Heineken. Yeah, and obviously as journalists, we're all working far too hard to uh, experience that. But no, I think I think uh, wine is definitely off the menu. Um, someone told me the cheapest bottle they'd found was uh, 50 quid. So, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I did find um, a good sports bar the other day. I watched the conclusion of the Argentina-Mexico group in there, and they had a couple of screens on. Um, it was a great atmosphere in there. It was like a sports bar. It's called The Goat. Um, greatest of all time, Goat. Um, and that was wicked. It was a good atmosphere in there. But yeah, it was getting my ass handed to me on the beers in a big way. Um, right, so Matt, you're on because I have been basically an unpaid promoter for your book for the last month, I would say, or last few weeks. All uh, all sales, uh, yeah, <laughs> greatly appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, but I'm glad you like, enjoyed it. I don't, um, I don't fluff anything up for no reason. I loved it, honestly. I, I've probably listened to it. I've got the audiobook version of it. Uh, I've probably listened to it like three or four times. Wow. Well, okay. uh, I've been doing a lot. I've been doing a lot of shuttling between here and Dubai. To, I've been doing a shoot with Evra over in Dubai uh, every few days, which is. It's getting pretty old having to fly out there for, 
for doing it, but I've been listening uh, as I've been going out there, and it's a sensational book. Is for um, we're going to delve into it, but for for those who haven't, can you give us a quick summary of of what it is? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's called 1999, Manchester United, the treble, and all that, and it is the treble season, the historic tri- uh, treble season, the unmatched pr- treble season, um, and I, I, you know, it is some of the most amazing drama we've ever seen ever played on a football pitch but i hope it's a lot more it's about the characters who you know i still think it's one of the most sort of you know charismatic dressing rooms that that, that there's ever been which is part of the reason for their success because it was this team of huge personalities big alpha characters it's about some of the off-field stuff at the time i was very lucky i moved up to manchester in the 90s didn't know the place at all and you know walked into the best gig in football writing to cover fergie's united and i think it's also unashamedly a nostalgia trip for a journalist because we had access then that we simply can't get now you know i mean that's the the world has changed that's no one's fault necessarily it's just that there was less media then newspapers i'm sure had a lot more influence and power and we got to be up close to fergie to beckham to Keane, all these characters so for all those reasons i just it's it's one of the sweet spots of my uh of my career basically and you know for, for i still got goosebumps going back over it you know whether that was the music the culture or of course the football well you opened the book talking about the hacienda and manchester and for me obviously growing up in manchester i was too young for the hacienda i love all that music um it was honestly it was a trip just listening to all of that sort of stuff and then getting into the football. So I, my first game was 1990, but I fell in love with Eric Cantona. So my love of Manchester United really is through the eyes of Cantona. And obviously then he passes the baton on to, to this team, which is my favourite team. I think there's a lot of United fans. For, I mean, let's be honest, it's not exactly a hipster choice, is it? It's a pretty good <laughs> the, team. The most successful <laughs> yeah, of all time. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, but I think even, even if it hadn't have won as much, I think that just the blend of every single thing about that team just worked, didn't it? It was such a, a joy to watch. Yeah, and it was it was you know had the Fergie spirit of of adventure through it, and I think again that is just something that um, you know we football. It was amazing to go back and, and hear how off the cuff it all was. I mean, we're so used now to you know even as fans we talk about low blocks or we talk about you know you know I, I love the pressing game here. The fact is that Fergie was a motivational genius. He was a guy who who spotted characters and, you know, he knew football clearly, you know, he played at a, a high level. But, you know, you talk to the players about sort of training and tactics and there wasn't a lot, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's like, it was almost shocking to be reminded that a lot of the training was effectively 11 v 11, you know, and they would be full blooded and they would batter each other. But their the training effectively was if you're up against Ryan Giggs in training, then that's the hardest thing you're <laughs> gonna face all season. You know, if you're up against Roy Keane in midfield, you're not gonna face anything harder than that out on the on in the real world. So yeah, it was there was nostalgia for that as well, because you know, much as we love the technical joys, you know, this was a hev- a brilliantly technical team, let's not get it wrong, Giggs and Beckham and Skulls and so on, but at the same time, there was something raw about them, I think. Yeah, we didn't necessarily tactically win too many games in that season. We did seem to win it by attitude, force of will and spirit more than tactics. I would say the, I think the 93 team and 94 team was a more tactical team. I think the 2008 team was a more tactical team. This team just seemed to be sort of an entertainers, didn't it? Well, that I mean, I think you know there was, you know, I mean, the the signing of York was was a genius move by Ferguson. You know, as I go into in the book, there were a lot of people who doubted at the time he wasn't a superstar. That you know, United had tried to get Cliver, <clears throat> who was obviously a much more sort of sexy choice, international choice. York comes in and he does add a little bit of X factor, that, and obviously brings out the best in Andy Cole. So there were, you know, there 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 was lots of sort of smart moves in the team but uh but yeah i mean <clears throat> you know to, to talk to you know i mean this new signings jesper bomquist turns up that season and he walks onto the training ground and he sees roy Keane battering teammates and he's like what the hell have i walked into the same way you have stamp you know they walk in the first thing Keane does is boot the ball at you and if you can't control it he's like you're not good enough teddy sheringham said the same you know they played this first game and Keane basically just wallops the ball at him and, you know, sort of laughs in his face when he can't control it and say, you better raise your game, you know. And, you know, as I go into the book, even the dynamics within the, the dressing room were fascinating. Everyone has this idea that 
because it's the most successful team of all time. Ah, oh, it must have been an incredible team spirit, the oh, harmony. Far from it. It's not. And far it's from far it. more complicated than that. And again, that was one of the reasons, you know, having covered it up close at the time, I was amazed almost what we missed. Yeah. You know? so. um, on the Roy Keane, one of my favourite Roy Keane anecdotes has always been the one with Dwight York, where he walks onto the training pitch. Because you can imagine Dwight York, it's summer, it's 98, he's got a chain on, he's probably wearing a sleeveless top. He's happy, he's saying hi to everyone. Keane slams a ball at him and goes, Cant and I would have controlled that. And walks off, and you just think, oh "My God!" Well, exactly. It was it was it was brutal. It was yeah, it was brutal. And and again, you know, you sort of look back on that and and sort of think, could you know, people ask it's a fascinating question. Could you do that now? Uh, you know, I, I'm not. I mean, clearly, brilliant leadership is timeless. But to be that, to be that, yeah, brutal on your teammates, um, <laughs> it would be interesting to, uh, to, to to for Roy to try that now. Uh, and what was it he did with Jasper Blomqvist? What's that? The say he did the same to Jasper Blomqvist. Yeah, what would he, he say to Blomqvist? Um, well, it was more just the fact that he, I mean, he just said he just said he seemed to be slaughtering everyone, and he was like, you know, he was used to Sweden and Italy, where it was, you know, very much encouraging and confidence building. And he said at first he thought Keane was basically an arrogant. Uh, I won't use the word, but he realized he soon realized that actually this was just his way, and this was his way of saying, if you're gonna, and this, this was why Ferguson signed these characters. It was like. To play for Man United, to go out with the expectations, the demands, is is hard, and I don't want flaky characters. Yeah, was the words keen used for Blancos when it was it like we paid five million for that? For that uh, p word, I think it was. But the, <laughs> yeah, but he he was, but yeah, and right, I mean, it's one interesting thing about the book is I I started out with the idea that Beckham was going to be the sort of thread through it because obviously we go from the 98 sending off the Argentina World Cup game, you know, and he hits absolute rock bottom. You know, I was part of the media that was giving him a heck of a hard time. You know, there were literally, you know, questions, could he stay in the country and play? The, the abuse was that bad. And then he goes through his, his redemption story, obviously in, in the summer of 99, you know, don't just win the treble, but he marries uh, Posh Spice. But it was a low-key affair they had, wasn't it? Exactly. Yes, just a, just just a <laughs> humble, modest, li modest little occasion. But so I thought Beckham was going to be the main thread. But the more I just recalled it, and the more I spoke to people, I think Roy Keane probably emerges as much as the main character through the book. Just because I think all the players say it just couldn't have happened without him. Yeah, um, I mean, I I almost don't know where to start with talking about specific players on here. Um, but I think we've touched a little bit on Dwight York there. One of my favourite bits of the story was one that I wasn't aware of, and it was that Dwight York was a literal go-between in the dressing room for communication from Andy Cole to, to Terry Sheringham. Yeah, I mean, so so as those who you know don't know, effectively, um, Teddy Sheringham and Andy Cole, um, when they played for England under Terry Venables, had had a... Just a complete fallout. There was a, a moment over nothing. Disrespect. So basically, I mean, I, you know, and Teddy was uh, Teddy was one of the most interesting people I spoke to for the whole book because, you know, he uh, he could be seen as aloof in his playing days, but he's mellowed and he he was really reflective. And he just told that yeah, he said that basically Cole turned up in the training camp. They just didn't get on. He thought Cole was sulky and surly. Andy Cole probably thought Teddy was flash and aloof. Um, and so then Cole, the, Cole and Andy Cole su sulky isn't out of order though I don't think it isn't and you know Andy was very you know reflective he's had, had you know I mean he almost died through uh through ill health so he you know he's got a different perspective on life but he you know he he, he knew he could be awkward and um but anyway said so um Teddy's playing this game against Uruguay I'm pretty sure it was Andy Cole's coming off coming on for him and uh, as Teddy walks off, Andy Cole holds up his hand to sort of do a high five and Teddy just walks straight past him. He just thinks, well, you know, we're not mates. Well, I'm not even going to pretend to be. But from that, you know, slight and that was a feud that lasted for years, decades. And so when Ted Teddy signs for Man United, all the I remember speaking to Gary Neville about it. He just goes, mm, that'll be interesting because they didn't speak and they were so stubborn. They didn't. So when Dwight York turns up, he will literally have Andy Cole saying, you know, tell that ass that you know i want the ball past here or tell him you know tell him you know this is where i'm running it's and, incredible uh, at what we achieved with them in the same team together and it didn't affect it yeah well the, so that one had, had sort of rumbled around but i mean the one that really shocked me doing the research because it hadn't been said before sitting down with teddy and him saying that roy Keane didn't speak to him for three and a half years so again uh, you'll, people will find that in the book but yeah yeah let's not give all the nuggets away but they're this. on yeah they're on a night out it basically almost comes to blows and um 
none of us realized even covering it at the time that from one sort of you know almost fist fight on a night out Roy Keane just blanks him Teddy Sherman for the so the whole way through the treble season you know on and off the pitch there's all these dynamics of you know Keane's not speaking to to Teddy Sheringham, uh, Andy Coles wants me to Teddy Sheringham, Roy Keane and Peter Schmeichel basically couldn't stand each other. So, yeah, At what point I, was I that, guess that's what, Fergie's that fight. There was fight was two years before that on yeah. a summer tour to, but you know that that still simmers along when 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 Roy was out, Peter Schmeichel had the, the armband and didn't want to give it back. So I guess you could say all of this even more adds to Fergie's genius is that he's got all this sort of stuff going on and yet he somehow keeps the show on the road. He somehow keeps yeah. them all motivated. He, he gives them a cause to fight for and they set aside all these feuds to, to, to fight for it. I'm glad you give Beckham the love that he deserves because for me, and I think you disagreed in the book actually, I think um, I thought he was better than Rivaldo over that 12 month. I thought if for me, the great players stand up in the bigger games and if you look at the... The key moments of the treble season, it's the two crosses for the goals in the final, it's the goals against, or the crosses for the, against Inter Milan, the performance against Juventus, both performances against Barcelona. I mean, that was the two times Rivaldo and Beckham went head to head. And if you watch both of those games, there's only one best player in the world. No, it's a, it's a fair, it's a fair point. I, I certainty, you know, I, I'm un, sort of unstinting in the praise for Beckham. I mean, I think, you know, because. I mean, we've, you could say we've seen it out here with what's been going on in Qatar and his role here. But, you know, Beckham's, if Beckham's fortitude as a footballer ever gets questioned, I just say, go back to that season, like you say. I mean, the scrutiny he was under was... was Unfathomable yeah. nowadays. I mean, I I'm not sure a player's been, like, been through anything like it since. And like you say, the, the game against Inter Milan, he's reunited with Simeone at Old Trafford. And the whole world is watching to see, you know, is he still petulant? You know, is he still flaky by nature it was cold and it, it was, was ice cold he ran the game he completely ran the game and it was one of the one of the great performances of that season and this is a guy you know you were talking about you know two top teams on the pitch top 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 players on the pitch and he was the best of them so yeah i mean uh, beckham you know i mean when i spoke to him he he was very good spoke spoke on the book you know he was it his best season i certainly think it was his most outstanding in terms of his of his character Oh, I think it was comfortably his best season. I, they were, from from the start, it started with a bang. Was it a free kick against? Was it Leicester or Wimbledon? Leicester, yeah, exactly. First first day of the season, United are in a hole, and who saves them? Him. Last day of the season, they're in a hole um, against Spurs. Who saves them? Beckham. And and some of the fin. I mean, we talk about his passing range. We talk about his free kicks, his corners, his crosses. But some of the goals he scored. I mean, everyone remembers Giggs's goal. Beckham's goal in the first half is a joke. Yeah. You know, the one he sticks in the in the joint against Tottenham is a joke of a goal. Well, and there's a free kick against Villa, which is well, I've, get it on YouTube. It is just yeah. I think you see. Uh, in fact, I, I spoke to someone about the uh, Gareth Southgate was in that team, but yeah, they they planned all week uh, how they were going to stop him, and you just see this this. I mean, it's almost like the ball bends in it, it halfway through, you know, on the way to goal. It's that good. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Some of the, you mentioned Fergie, obviously, is a, a huge part of, of the book and, and that season. There's so many of the off-the-cuff stories of Fergie bollocking everyone from kids to reporters to players. Uh, give us a couple of those. Yeah, I mean, there was one on, well, on the players, there's a great one. Um, i trying to remember who told me this one, but they're one of the class of 92, but they, which I, again, I hadn't heard before, but when they're, they, you know, they do the little rondos, um, sort of, uh, you know, keep, um, Piggy in the middle, effectively, before every training session, and and they did it older players and younger players, and sometimes Fergie would come down and join in. I mean, that all the players said he was pretty terrible at it, but <laughs> you know he he wanted to just you know feel the mood and just have a sort of lighter morning. Anyway, one day he's with the older players, and the ball from the younger players just keeps flying into their circle. So eventually, he turns around and says, "Right, if that ball comes in here one more effing time," and he points to this big building on the horizon and says, "You lot are running round it." So I think it could, probably Nicky Buck, because he was the most mischievous of the lot, just thinks, right, let's test him. So it boots the ball over into their circle. And next thing you know, Fergie's going, right, you lot, run around that university. So they, this is the class of 92. It's the most, you know, Ryan Giggs, Beckham, Nevels, were the most celebrated young superstars in the game. And they are literally tracksuit boots running around Salford. On tarmac, but, in but, boots. Yeah, on, in their... In, in all their kit, and they're saying they're running past the shops, past the houses, past you know old old ladies walking their <laughs> shopping and stuff, watching all these like and uh, they're all just go bemused by it. it's the day before a game in the treble season. They get back and one of them is still sniggering, 
about it when they get back five bars later and Fergie sees them snigger and he's like, All right, that's it, you lot. I don't want to see you again and throws them out of training. So mm-hmm. it's just, again, it was just the idea that, you know, can you imagine now seeing Erling Haaland running around the shops in his tracksuit, you know? The thing is, where City's located, it's more possible. Where United's <laughs> located, you've got to run for a couple of miles before you're going to see anyone. True, but it's just, I think there's something about, again, it's sort of unashamedly nostalgic just to talk about it. Just I loved hearing these stories. And I think it, it helped, obviously, there's the separation of a few years that, you know it loosens loosens the the tongues a bit i guess and 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 a lot of these stories flock out and obviously fergie against the media it was a you know it was one of the joys of the job and one of the challenges of the job that it was it could be war you know i was on the daily express for some of my time up there he got the express at home every morning fergie so you were right in the firing line if he if you wrote something he didn't like and he would not think twice about ripping your head off. You mentioned the the access and the relationship with the likes of Sir Alex changed. Um, give us an example of like what it looked like in that season and the build up to that season. So, so I mean, up in most of the nineties. So, you know, this is before um, you know the internet explosion of me- of media. There would be literally, you know, some Friday mornings there could be five, six, seven people just down at the cliff. It was the last sort of proper year of the cliff and you would just be in these huddles and it could be, you know, some on the record, some off the record, but it was intimate. So, you know, he would have read every word in the papers. By everyone that's standing yeah. there. And so, you know, he literally would sit, you know, he would say, right. And it, it, might, it might literally be the sort of fifth paragraph of a story where you'd written, you know, speculation that so-and-so is going to be sold or so-and-so could be out. And he, he wanted control. That's his thing. Fergie's great mantra of management was control and and the hardest thing for him to control in some ways was the media because you know you can't you know we're not north korea so it just became a constant battle of wills and obviously as a journalist part of you is thinking well i want to you know i need to be in these press conferences because you know it's alex ferguson the biggest manager in the game and part of you is thinking well if i get a great story so just in briefly me and a pal once this is obviously before the treble season we were just down the training ground Loiter skulking around because we knew Fergie was away and Konchelskis walked out and we just went, oh, all right, Andre, you know, hoping for a quiet word. And he said, no, I want transfer. I want to leave. And we looked at each other, went, what? He just jumped in his car and roared off. Luckily, we knew is the guy who was working as a translator for him and said, we just had this weird chat with Andre. And he was like, oh, Oh God, you know, I wish he hadn't told you that, but we got this exclusive, stuck it on the back pages, and oddly enough, the next day, uh, <laughs> Fergie pretty much had us by the throat and threw us out, and we got a band for, I think, we got a, I think that was a six-week ban. Um, so, for telling the truth. For tell, yeah, for telling the truth. So you, if it's speculation and it's just something that you got wrong, you heard something, it was incorrect, it happens. That's but, fine, isn't it? When it's out of the player's mouth. Exactly. So, you know, it, but it was the fact of, you know, it was the control thing. It was like, I don't care if it's true or not. You didn't, you know, didn't we, should, we didn't, you didn't, <laughs> didn't run it past him or didn't get hit. You know, basically, if we had, he would have, you know, ripped our heads off anyway. So either way, we couldn't win. But uh, I was, it was, but at least we had that intimacy. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, to be screamed and shouted at by Fergie was almost better than being ignored. You could say. <laughs> There's something cool about the cliff in how crap it was, I think, isn't it? Like, I used to go in the school holidays and stuff towards the late nights. I actually think I went, the last time I spent, like, the whole day there, I think, was, was in the summer of 98. And I would, it's, you try and explain this to people now, it was like, yeah, I basically, I sat there, I watched the entire training session, I shook hands with everyone from Fergie to Beckham, not Roy Keane, because he tries to run you over, but like, everybody, you sit there, you shake hands, but you watch two hours of training and yeah. just sit there and all that there is is a blue tow rope in between you and it, and, and the mad thing is there's only about eight people there yeah no it i mean it's again the nostalgia I mean, it's good to hear your nostalgia for it because it is i went back there you know i was doing the research and now you just drive into this place and think did the greatest british um football team of all time come from is, from is this, this it yeah is there not nine other fields exactly. is there not a gym there's, like there's a pitch i mean they used to okay so they drive over to littleton road to to use some of the pitches there but it's just uh, it, you know it's like a sort of municipal little old sports ground and it's you know and you do feel the ghosts of bobby charlton and george best on those pitches because that's where they they learned their craft as well but no i think you know it's it, it again that was part of the intimacy and actually i spoke to nicky butt was very good on this that he said he thinks something was lost when they moved because in the cliff 
you know, you had the youth team players changing right next door to the senior players and using one canteen. And he said, you're breathing the same air. You, you know, you got Brian Robson will be telling you, oh, I saw you do this, don't, you know, telling you how to behave, talking to you all the time. And he said, all these clubs now with academies where they're building separate buildings and it's all separated and there's a hundred pitches. Look, it's the modern game, we understand it. But he said something's been lost if you don't have the direct contact between the kids and the senior players. They should be learning off each other. They should be seeing how the senior players behave, how they train, how they go about their work. Wasn't one of our, I want to say it was Ollie, but I could be wrong, but hasn't one of our recent managers took a training session back at the cliff? It was Ollie, yeah. Was. I think it was, I mean, you could say a slight sign of desperation. I think it was when he was sort of trying to just get the real ethos and momentum back. So we did go back there, I think, you know, hoping, I guess, that just if you, you're on that grass and you smell in the air, that the spirit of United would come back. Now, yeah, obviously it didn't work, work out for him, but... Yeah, I mean, it's still there. It's used as a, a community pitch. Um, you know, there's still there's still some stuff there, but it, there was to, I, I heard somewhere that it could be sold, but I think that'd be a real shame. It almost feels like it's part. That's heartbreaking. Yeah, part because of the, the club, what the club's going to make in terms of revenue for selling it is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, the foundation needs a base, and I know Man United Foundation uses that place. Yeah, um, but that needs to be. Yeah, that needs to be a, a working museum. No, it? totally. I, I mean, I, you know, I was it was that was a rumor. I haven't heard any any more on that. So, but I, I think 100 percent that it should stay within the club because it is, you know, it, it is and should forever be part of United's history and, and a massive part of United's history. I mean, they trained there for dec the, the greatest teams Man United have ever had trained out of that place. It's post-war, so it's 46 onwards to you know, 90, yeah. 2000, 2001. Yeah, that'd be horrendous if we was to leave there. And actually, I watched a, probably three or four under 18s games there a season. They go and take them back there. And I like that as well. I think that's a good thing. And it's an immaculate pitch. Yeah. It's hard work finding a grass pitch in Manchester that's that good. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, cool. Um, Roy Keane then. So he ends up being uh, a little bit of a player in this book. Um, it was interesting that you actually touched on some of the tribulations that he had in the final week, actually, because. I find it so hard to believe that more wasn't made of what he was getting up to at the time um, in the last week of the season. In terms of the arrest and... Uh, yeah, yeah, can you imagine? So for those that are aware, it's, he was cleared, right? He yes. was cleared. Yeah, yeah. So Roy Keane gets arrested for assaulting a woman the week of our FA Cup final. Yeah. And Sir Alex Ferguson goes and gets him out of jail. <laughs> like, that's not like a, a yarn. That happened, and I think Sky TV capture him walking into Bootle Street Station, don't they? Yeah. No, it, well, again, it, and it was how nuts minor. And, nuts and raw the whole thing was. So, yeah, so basically, obviously, the league is won. There's another week till the till the cup final, so the lads inevitably go out and uh, celebrate fully. And, yeah, and, and, and it was a, it sounds like it was a set-up job. Um, there's a couple of women and a, and a guy basically, you know, say, you know, buy some drinks, and when Roy effectively tells them to F off, someone throws a glass and a drink, and, you know, he, he, but then, you know, equally, you know, I think Roy's honest enough to, to know that uh, he wasn't the hardest to provoke. Anyway, he, he ends up in the, the, the clink, and um, Fergie has to come and haul him out. It, it never led to charges or anything, but again, we were at the Fergie's, this was all the night, so we had the Fergie's pre-match, you know, they always do a big pre-match sort of uh, cup final, um preview and and the first question is basically you know where's roy Keane? Is, is, <laughs> is he out of the police cells and will he be fit for the fa cup final so again it was just it was just it was amazing to go back to that year and just there were so many episodes that i knew had happened but i'd almost forgotten it happened that season i mean rupert murdoch trying to buy the club yeah you know, huge part of that season. there was there was just all this stuff that was happening and it was like you know i felt like i sort of kept hitting the jackpot i was like oh my god that that was that season as well you know yeah, for, and obviously we'll throw a link in the description for the book. Um, it's probably worth buying for one of the final chapters alone, which just talks about how Dwight York celebrated. Yes, I think I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll work out what's, leave it what's, the, the, what's, appro what's I would, appropriate. I would say leave it for the book, <laughs> but you need to go get it. I mean, yeah, Dwight yeah, let's York, just say he had a good... was insane, it was insane player. Yeah, no, he was. And that was such a sharp signing by Fergie because he was, he was a very different character to... What people might have expected from a Ferguson son, you know, he he did like, shall we say, the good life. Um, but that season, you know, and I actually think, you know, he, he obviously didn't sustain as a United player, maybe because of that. Um, but that season he was so focused. And I think again, back to the chemistry, you know, he 
Andy Cole had had a tough time before. You know, he'd scored a lot of goals, but I still there was a lot of talk of him going, wasn't there? Every summer, every summer, it was he'd never quite rediscovered the absolute brilliance of that Newcastle season where he seemed to score with every touch. You know, he he had a slightly awkward relationship with Cantona, and he had definitely had the one with Teddy Sheringham, and it was Dwight York was the first time where it was like I'm loving this, and that you know that partnership is one of the great Premier League partnerships, all because of. What happened that season? And probably a lot down to the sheer personality of Dwight York coming in and going, I'm everyone's mate. Yeah, exactly. And that's the players all love it. I mean, they talk about, you know, he was, again, I'm sure, you know, it contributed to what was done that season was that he just changed the mood. So, you know, they were an incredibly intense group. You know, Roy was this domineering personality, but you also had someone in it who was willing just to basically say, lads, <laughs> Loosen up. We're here to play football for Man United. You and, know, uh, there was one thing that I didn't know until I read the book as well. But at the, in that running, Dwight York, he's just almost piss taking. Yeah, just ten more wins, lads. Just yeah, just eight Doing more the wins, countdown. lads. Just seven more wins, lads. Yeah, no, and <laughs> I think it's it, every every dressing room needs this, and it, it is this cocktail of characters. I mean, people say, did, "Why did you go back and do it?" Partly the achievement, obviously, partly being lucky enough to do it. But I think it was the characters. I just wanted to go back. Who wouldn't want to sit down with Dwight York and Ted and Peter Schmeichel and David Beckham and recall the greatest year of their lives. Literally, you go through the team and every single person had, no one had like a straightforward, it was all right, seven out of 10 sort of season. You had Peter Schmeichel deciding to retire, essentially, and then just leave. You had um, Roy Keane force us into the final, have a probably one of his top two or three seasons. I think he was probably better in 2001, but still pretty good. And then missed the pretty much missed the FA Cup final and the final of the Champions League. Uh, you have every, the, I mean, the story of Beckham was alone, like you said, could have literally just been the book. Yeah. Um, you have Andy Cole and Dwight York creating an all-time great partnership. You have the this weird thing going on with Teddy Sheringham. The guy who ends up winning it's the guy that was nearly sold to Tottenham in the summer. Yeah. Um, who we've not even discussed. The guy who, who scores the winner. You have um, Ryan Giggs having a, a mad season with injuries and struggling to get through. And, and basically, Jesper Blomquist has deputised for him the entire season. But because he's done that, he comes in at the end of the season in the big games and just does yeah. bits. You have Nicky Bott, who plays way more than I think everybody realises. Um, well, that was the th that was the amazing thing. I mean, I th there was, and I, I mean, and the format definitely helped because I, I wanted to do ninety nine chapters because you can get all these little details in. It's a great. The audio book does you in because it says hundred. I text you and I say, <laughs> yeah. "Oh, you fucking missed a trick here." And he's like, "No, I'm not." Once prologue, and I was like, "All right." The uh, but the pub uh, the great pub quiz question of to 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 yeah everyone would have their idea of what their first eleven was that season. Even Nicky Butt would say, you know, it was going to be Roy Keane and Scholes. But what people think is the first 11, Schmeichel, Neville, Jonsson, Stam, Irwin, Beckham, Scholes, Keane, Giggs, Dwight, and, uh, Dwight York and Andy Cole started twice that season. Insane. Which is, I mean, when I first stumbled across that, I was like, no, I don't, you know, I literally checked it 10 times because I didn't believe it. But Well, Giggs didn't play that often. I didn't start that and often. And Jonsson obviously got some injuries. But yeah, it was just a, yet another quirk of this season. But it showed it It was the the season when rotation began properly. I think, again, up, you know, up till now, we just take it for granted. Managers, you know, especially the top clubs packed with superstars, they just rotate, rotate, rotate. Up till then, it didn't happen. Um, no, but the depth that we had... And it was kind of weird, like, sort of pretty much everybody knew their spot within that hierarchy as well. So that was the starting 11. But like we said, just off that, you had the, the backup strikers of Sheringham and Solskjaer. How we managed to do that? Because he still wanted Clive as well, didn't he? Yeah. After yeah, he yeah. signed York. Yeah, no, he was, he was um, I mean, Clive, you know, and again, it's just one of the great what ifs. What, you know, Clive wins one league uh, title in Barcelona in four years and United win the treble. So, you know, he, it was Clive who turned United down. How would the season have worked out differently if he had come? You know, it's fascinating. And, you know, and, and again, for, I mean, you could say that makes Fergie a, a lucky, lucky manager in some ways. But yeah, he's a guy who just rode his luck better than any manager in the history of football. Basically. Yeah, the likes of Blomquist, Phil Neville, Nicky Butt, uh, Henningberg, they all played a huge part in, in yeah. that achievement. Well, David and David May, you know, he's injured for most of the time, comes back for the last half dozen games and ends up uh, owning the podium at, uh, <laughs> <laughs> at the new camp. <laughs> Yeah, in, incredible season. It's an incredible book as well. Like I said, I, I ain't blowing anyone's book up for nothing, but um, I stumbled on it just scrolling through Audible, and I was like, how have I missed this? How long's it been out? It's been out uh, a couple of months now, I think, I'm trying to think. It's sort of start, start of the season, but uh, yeah, available. When did it hit Audible then? 
um sim- it should have been similar times so but yeah it's been um and uh, you know hearing a lot of nice things even at the, i mean i'd like to think united fans can't go wrong with it but I, to my amazement i've even had some uh arsenal fans saying they enjoyed it so um but it is very for those who are wondering it is and there's not many arsenal fans watch this so don't worry but it, <laughs> it is very complimentary of arsenal because arsenal took us quite the way oh, obviously they were the reigning champions double double winners from 98 the reason we went so hard in 99 is because we had a worthy opponent. Yeah, no, totally. And it was, it was almost inspired, you know, and it had really got under Fergie's skin that Wenger was getting all this praise from the likes of me. Um, yeah, he was seen as the greatest you the know, thing in English football, the professor, he was changing the game and that really wound Fergie up. And he said, he's coming into the season roaring with defiance for, for that. You know, King's coming into it roaring with defiance because he'd missed the previous year with injury and seeing Arsenal win the double, you know, and I speak to Tony Adams in the book, obviously about the epic Villa game and, 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 but yeah, he, he said it was, you know, they walked off that pitch and, you know, he's absolutely deflated, you know, crestfallen and at the same time realized, and this is one of the greatest rivalries in English football. Yeah. For me, that 98 Arsenal side was better than the one that drew loads of games. Yeah, for me, I thought it was the best. Well, that's what you know. So you speak to the likes of Gary Neville and uh, about it, and they say that the '98 Arsenal team was was tougher. You know, it didn't have the va va voom of of the Henri years, but it was it was a proper heart. You know, it had pace, it had power, and it had a real strength of character. Brilliant. Anyway, I, we will throw a link in the description. I've recommended it plenty, but. I can't recommend it enough. For those of you that was alive at the time, it's a trip. And if you weren't alive at the time, and you want to know why we still keep going on about it all the time, go and check it out. It's like you said. I mean, we've not even touched on Yap Stammy and the the. Has there ever been a? I know there hasn't, but I'm going to just pose the question: Has there ever been a player that comes in is as hyper successful as Yap Stammy is and then launched in the same? Good question. No, I mean, you Maybe know, Cantona. and he and, and he had some wobbles at the start. I mean, you know, Yep Stam came in and again, he was, you know, he found it tough. But I remember it, a red issue. Probably just a photograph that we paid ten and a half million for Steve Bold. Can you imagine? <laughs> Brutal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Teddy Sheringham, he has a really tough time that season, you know, um, and he ends up, as you say, scoring in the FA Cup final and scoring one of the most famous goals in United's history. So, yeah, it's an absolute roller. It was a roller coaster for the players, and that, I hope, makes it a, a roller coaster to read as well. Yeah, as I was 15 at the time, and I, my first game being 1990, I've kind of just seen us pretty much win a trophy every single season of my match going sort of life. It felt the most natural thing ever that you know, we would go to places like Juventus and and people don't realize as well that that, that that Juventus was the Barcelona team that beat us in those two finals. That's how good that Juventus team was. Yeah. So to go two nil down in the Del Alpe, it's over. Well, I, li- I literally wrote that. So it was a you know it, people if you're doing a live report for a newspaper, um, you're, you're writing during the game. And um, I remember turning to my colleague when the second goal went in and going, "Oh, this will be a, this will be an easy night," you know. Basically, United have blown it again. Um, literally started typing, you know, the, the the dream's over for another year. So, yeah, if you if you come back against the Juventus team in their backyard, which had been to the previous two, three European Champions League finals, and has got Zidane, the best player in the world, and has got Deschamps and Davids, never Conte, mind, never mind, Davio. yeah, Conte, who was as nuts as a player as <laughs> as he's since become as a manager, and Montero, and just one of the greatest defenses. Yeah, it's it's. I, I was lucky, obviously, as part of the book, I went back and obviously watched the 90 minutes of, of you know, um, certainly of all the key games. Is, and that, I is w- that where Fergie said the football bloody hell thing? That was after New was Camp, was after but New yeah, Camp. I think he describes the, I, I think if you watch, if you're going to watch a half, watch the first half of Man United in Turin. I mean, it's like, it's two all by half time and it just feels like, you know, you, you're, you're almost exhausted watching it back again. Oh, it's, in, it's insane. Like, I... I probably not once a month but it's pretty often watch the treble season it, and it's it's so good my favorite celebration is the andy cole one in the new camp after the little one two that that one two with him he runs over to the focus board on the yeah the advertising board <laughs> yeah 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 there's a story behind that as well but yeah. i'll leave that one. yeah leave that one for the book anyway matt this is brilliant brilliant reminiscing about when united used to be top <laughs> um but yeah that that's what makes the 99 season so special it was we were up against a very worthy opponent in Arsenal, we were up against seriously worthy opponents in Bayern Munich, Barcelona, Inter Milan with R9. Um, 
Juventus, and obviously we meet Bayern Munich again. In the fact, I actually spoke to Lof Amateus um, two weeks ago out okay. here. Um, I hope you rubbed it in. I was, I was talking to him about Germany. Um, so I, I thought Germany would be massively underrated. Turns out I was wrong. Um, and I was like, do I mention 99? He's been so nice. Not fucking mentioning it. So I had to, and I was like, look, really sorry to do this, but you know, can I have your thoughts on 99? And he just laughed and he went, the best team lost. And I was like, yeah, I got no qualms of saying that. Like no qualms of saying that we were not the better team on a night. He won everything in his career apart from a champions league. Oh, so. And he were when he went off the pitch. Yeah. Oh. oh well, you <laughs> you did you did a Jeff Shreves on Ivanovic job on him, did you? So. <laughs> I I couldn't help myself, but like he was a ledge, uh, and he is a ledge. You know, yeah. Ballon d'Or winning, World Cup winning, won everything, and should have added the Champions League. But well, again, it just it, it just underlines again how nuts nuts the achievement was, nuts. You know, and also I mean just to, I mean you know as, as I've been writing it for the last two years, and each year you sort of think. Um, as an author, like, oh my, Man City are going to do it, Liverpool are going to do it, you know, all that stuff about quad squads. And, you know, considering the depth that these, these yeah, clubs have got Yeah, I, I think now, it will and, happen. It, and I'm sure it will happen, but I think it, again, just underlines the achievement that every time we're saying, oh, you know, they're on course for this, on course for that. And you just stumble. These teams, great teams, have stumbled. And again, it just, it, I think it just shows that it's not just about it's partly about having great players and a great manager, but it just needs the stars to align and it needs massive depths of character and resourcefulness and uh, and balls. <laughs> yeah, I, I do worry City are going to do it, especially with Erlen Haaland. I think you know, it's 1-0 to City at every single game, but we're not talking about that because this was a happy podcast, but uh, cheers for Matt. Like I said, there will be a link in the description. If you're still looking for someone for Christmas, it's probably still time to get one ordered, but if it's a selfish buy, get it on Audible and just sit there and make you drive to work a lot happier in the morning because it's, to talk it's about brilliant it. thank you Matt. nice one Cheers, thank you